Crossroads Media. Now we are talking. Take those singles and shove it. I don't want to see another stretch of 38,563 singles again in my life because that's what it felt like, torture. Seriously, I felt like I was in one of those movies and I'm getting waterboarded. I'm having five people tie me down. They're putting washcloths on my face and just pouring water, gallons and gallons and gallons and gallons of water on those washcloths hoping I don't make it. And that's what it feels like watching this team hit singles until this game. Show me the power. Show me Bryson Stott's ability to drive the baseball and go close. Love it. Ew, that was so sick. And it was so sick to watch Boom. And it was so sick to watch Marsh, even though it barely grazes by. It barely gets over just by an inch. We're talking about oh, one of these. And if you're listening to the audio version, I'm doing what the what the umps do when it's a bomb. You know, you twirl the finger and you're getting all the damn bases. By the way, you can check out the podcasting platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, all your platforms podcasting platforms, Sports Talk with Broads, Broads Media, type it in, five-star rating, a review. Thank you so much for all the crazy support. Thank you so much for Ranger Suarez being in my life. Six innings pitched of scoreless ball. And by the way, my man throws eight punches. Sorry, you weren't sniffing him today at all. That guy was a machine. Good luck. Good luck. When Ranger Suarez has that poise, he's normally always calm. He's always in check of his emotions, right? But then he's on it times 10. And I felt like I was watching one of the games where he was on it times 10. Eight punches. Dude was sickening. So was Marte. Marte's been really good in relief. Did we find our random guy that nobody knows about before the season begins and then he becomes a fan favorite and the dude is sensational? Is that Marte this season? I'm starting to open up the eyes. I'm starting to hear everybody out. I can absolutely get convinced if that's the case. And if Sir Anthony plops, then maybe someone else can deliver. The only thing that hurts me more than anything else when I hear that sentence or hear that hypothetical of one man being great, one man being bad, is imagine if both can just be unreal. Imagine if Sir Anthony can be a, a, a really ridiculous weapon for you. And I'm sorry to harp on that, but sometimes I just wonder if we can maximize everything all at once, even though baseball never works that way. Because while Brandon Marsh is tearing the cover off the ball, Bryce Harper is hitting 196. Now, last episode, I said after one of the anytime hotline calls, I believe that I feel I have to attack Bryce Harper I'm obligated to do it because whenever I do and I criticize him, he hits three home runs in one game. He'll hit a grand slam and flip me the double bird. But I did it without it really being the moment. Today would be the day, regardless of whatever I said yesterday, today would be the day after this game, grounding out into a double play, having two strikeouts as well, even though we had a magnificent glove over at first base, and I think that it was a huge part of the early start, you're able to get Ranger to settle it. How many times have we seen, whether it's the Phillies and their own poor defense, or what we just witnessed out in St. Louis, your starter can be on a nice rhythm and maybe get out of the first or second inning with eight innings, or not eight, sorry, eight pitches thrown in that particular inning, but then someone makes an error and now you have to throw 15 more. Now you're at 21 when you walk off the mound for the first time instead of eight. Well, Bryce Harper having a beautiful glove over at first, but Boom, with the ability to barehand one. And this is on the anniversary of him saying that he hates this place. So for him to do that, for him to have the homer, and of course the unnecessary slide on his ass to finish out the game in the ninth inning. I don't know what was that. I don't know what that was. I don't know why he felt the need to do it, but whatever. Just get your wins. Nick Nelson made it a little tighter than it needed to be. So uh, maybe, you know, we can do a little better there. So no one has to get up in the bullpen, start stretching stretching their arm because the way that they handle things, someone accidentally warms up in a, in a game. and Not accidentally, I'm saying someone doesn't do their job where you're forced to have to get someone to, I don't know, maybe stretch their fingertips out and he might hit the 
15 day IL. Oh, hold on. You stretched out your pinky? No, dude. <laughs> I don't want to see you for three years. Come back. Let me see if you'll be all right. Yet, you can have Tommy John and they'll push you back in nine months. Whatever. Whatever. I just, I, I just, uh, I'm just proud of this team. I'm just excited that we saw a game that actually looks like the Phillies that we know. But getting to my point on Bryce Harper, this would be the day that I'd criticize him after the couple of strikeouts and the grounding out into a double play. Let's go. Let's go. So maybe he has the answer we're looking for on Friday. I'm doing this for the people. The criticism is because I need to. All right, I have to try and inspire this guy somehow. And I know for a fact him and Embiid throw this on their beats pill while they're working out. Slug. No slug, says Rob Thompson. That interaction with Howard Eskin before the game was hilarious. If you didn't catch it, which I'd be shocked, because if you're listening to this, you're probably a diehard Phillies fan. And if you're a diehard Phillies fan, you're probably following everybody on the beat. But I'm going to play you the, <laughs> the first thing I see when I open up Twitter is four tweets in a row of exactly what I'm talking about now. It's so funny. So I'll just let you guys hear it. This is Rob Thompson to Howard Eskin about the way this team has been performing offensively and how they're going to turn things around and what can Rob do as a manager to try and make that impact and get the fellas rolling. What can the manager do? try to help the situation to score runs. 16 straight singles without an extra base hit is not going to get it done. What can you do? Uh, Just keep running them out there because we're going to slug. And if you don't think we're going to slug, you ain't watching the games. Uh, I think you're going to slug, but do you do it enough? Uh, You know, the regular season is fine. You're going to make the playoffs. Let's Let's be honest. I don't know that. Well, I do. Right. But you don't know we're going to slug. Okay. <laughs> I know you're going to slug at times. Yeah. It's just, don't you have to generate runs when you're not hitting Well, sometimes, them? you know, and we're, what are we, fourth in uh, stolen bases. But we've been picked off a few times. So. And you can hit and run. We had that conversation earlier. You can do some other things. But, you know, this, this team is built to slug. That is the truth. And that's why I fight with a lot of you every day. You got to think of it, right? And trust me, I am a little interested on how some of this is going to play out because there's no doubt about it. I see what Matt Gelb was writing on The Athletic a few days ago. He released an article breaking down how, um, you know, uh, Rob Thompson mentioned how they're trying to be selective, but they're also trying to be aggressive and they're also trying to not chase things out of the zone because that was their downfall last year. And I almost feel that they're overthinking. They're a golfer. And I think I used this example before, but they're a golfer and they're thinking about their mechanics before they line up to their ball. So they're thinking of the hips. They're thinking of keeping their head down. They're thinking of their shoulders. They're thinking of finishing the swing. And when you have five or six different ways of uh, having your brain turn around and bounce off the walls while you're trying to hit a golf ball, sometimes you're overcomplicating it. So the reason why this is important to bring up right now is when you're trying to ask someone like Nick Costa, This team is built to rake. This team needs to hit home runs. That's how they're going to win. They are a one-dimensional baseball team offensively, and that's reality of it. They are built to demolish, demolish the cover off the ball nonstop as a force and a juggernaut of seven guys who can do it, eight guys who can do it, and there is zero breathing room, good luck. That's what they do well. So to ask them to change, to ask Nick Castellanos to try other things, and look, the alternative wasn't working. He was striking out on a slider away every single damn time. I've never seen someone strike out on the same pitch. Every single time. Ryan Howard definitely got a lot of heat. All right, he got a lot of blame, and a lot of fans were upset with maybe watching the way that he striked out consistently too. But the difference is that man's given us 60-plus. That man's given us the best ride we've been on. That ain't happening with Nick. He hit his free agency period the best time ever. That dude hit like 309. With 34 homers, 100-plus RBI, that guy was absurd his final year in Cincinnati. But if you looked at previous years, 
It never truly was close to that, but I never thought that his downfall would be this bad. They are built to rake, and I think if you ask 30-plus-year-old guys like Kyle Schwarber, Nick Castellanos, who've been playing baseball for so damn long to just change what they do all of a sudden, I don't know if you're setting them up for success. Now, that doesn't mean that you just bang your head into a wall because, as I alluded to, Nick Castellanos struggled at the end of last season, but he was doing something in the middle of the season that was that actually some sort of pulse. We actually saw life. So there was something that he was doing well then. Was he was he being uh, less chasey? Like what they're doing now and trying to drill in his head, is that what was... Is that what he was doing that was resulting in success in the back end of last year before we hit the playoffs? I don't know. I'm just asking questions. But reality is, I think the more you ask some of them to do right now, maybe you're just doing too much. Maybe you're overcomplicating things and let them just be them. That's why you brought Nick in. That's why you bought Trey in. That's why you brought a lot of these guys in and you bought them and you gave a bunch of money around and you signed them to free agency heavy deals because of what they provide. Let them be them and we'll rake from there. And maybe that can just get them less tense, more comfortable, having fun, letting the game come to them. Be natural. And expectations change that for sure. Now the fan base watches their regular season differently. A couple years ago, don't get me wrong, we weren't satisfied with some of the starts to the year and that adds pressure and the talking points are very intense and we start to ask some serious questions about who deserves to be here, who doesn't. But when you have the World Series runs, and I'm sure these players would say they wouldn't want it any other way, but that doesn't mean in the moment when it's actually happening, it's easy to battle through. It's easy adversity because it's not. It's an entire town and you're entire supporting cast really figuring out what are we doing here? Why are we not getting the results that we want? Once you make a few World Series runs or NLCS runs, deep playoff runs, we're ready to run people out of town after a 2-5 and five start or a 5-10 and ten start. And reasonably so. I don't think there's anything wrong with our reaction to it, but it makes it more tense. It makes it more hostile. And that's the case when you have expectations to win a championship, and that's right. That's how it should be. But I'm just throwing it out there. Like, yeah, let's not have it as complicated from a thinking about what you're doing in the batter's box. Too much perspective. Let them be that they can play naturally. And then, boom, before you know it, everybody is less stressed. Because let's be honest, when the team wins baseball games, as the people... As the ones walking around town, going to Wawa, grabbing a cup of coffee, holding the door for the guy behind you, the family behind you, the female behind you, maybe even getting the person's coffee. But hey, don't worry about it. I got you, Bill. Uh, yeah, don't worry about it. Hey, have a good day at work. You know, you just see the guy Bill every single day at the WA. One of those. <laughs> Come on. Andy. Andy. What do you got today, your kid? Huh? You know what I'm saying? One of those. Ah, oh, Andy, man, he's a good guy. I got his coffee today. When you win, that's the vibe. When you lose, it's that fucking team, huh? <laughs> yeah. Now I got to go to work. You know what I mean? I got to scratch my eyes out for the next eight hours. I need three of these coffees. That's the conversation instead. We can't be having that, all right? So the Phillies need to know that the way they play on any given day really does dictate the world in the city of Philadelphia and the, and the whole entire shine or rain, however they play. That's sort of how it goes. All right, I don't even know what the hell I'm talking about anymore. Uh, let's go to the Anytime Hotline and see what you all are feeling out there. Phillies took game one of the, of the set against the Pirates, and I'm happy. I, I'm glad to see that they're starting to hit some home runs again. Marsh is awesome. Bowman, a great game. Uh, Bryson Stott really needed that one. Hopefully, it gets something going with him. Um, Ranger Suarez was excellent. Union Marte was great. But I'm just struggling to really kind of understand what our highly paid guys are, are doing at the plate. I, I know Bryce Harper, his whole thing is about being aggressive. Um, but the way that he looks at the plate right now, it just doesn't seem like he is you know, really, he, he hasn't, like, figured it out quite yet. And, you know, it's been tough for him. Um, and, like, Trey Turner, like, I'm concerned with him. Like, is he ever going to start get? is he ever going to become the player that we paid him to be? I don't think so. I hope that the long-term answer is no, but good win today. 
I don't think that that Trey Turner is going to turn it around. I really don't. I am definitely afraid for sure. I think I have more faith in Trey than I do Nick. You better hope that Trey gets some sort of consistency going here or it's going to be a long, long contract. Bryce, I'm willing to give a bit of time to just because it's Bryce Harper. Rob Thompson is claiming that it's just his timing. His timing is off. But if there was anything physical going on or if he does have a stiff back and he's dealing with some things and he's just battling through because it's hard to keep Bryce Harper on the bench and and not playing this early into the season... They would never tell us. So I wouldn't be surprised if there was something going on. I also wouldn't be surprised if this is just Bryce Harper waiting to get hot. And once he does, well, we know exactly how it goes. But it could just be standard spring training. Wasn't exactly what he wanted it to be. Now that bleeds into the start of the regular season. And maybe that's what we're dealing with. Because, honestly, I'm sure there were a couple games here and there that I'm missing out on. But we've only really had one massive one. And don't get me wrong, that massive one was pretty damn massive. Multiple home runs, grand slam, a lot of runs batted in. You could only dream of having an effort like that. But let's be honest with ourselves. Outside of that... We're used to seeing Bryce Harper be the headline for positive stuff. Maybe three out of 12 games, four out of 12 games. Not one. Not one. Trey Turner went one for four. Whit Merrifield 0 for three. Nick 0 for three. Batting 152 on the season. (laughs) Boom's been great. Marsh has been great. But you're right. Bryson Stott having that hit. He desperately needed it. I really didn't even notice how bad it's been. Because remember, someone mentioned to me in a previous show about Bryson Stott. He's got to pick it up. Like, I don't know. Has it been that bad? And then I saw 211 batting average. I'm like, whoa. Now, full disclosure, over the WrestleMania weekend, I didn't dive into every at-bat. So, you know, maybe, maybe that was swaying my opinion a little bit. But he needed that big time, and I hope that that makes him just feel great again. And then he hits another one, maybe tomorrow. And then we get a three-game streak on Saturday. And then we get every single game against Pittsburgh. They sweep him 4-0, and he hits four bombs. I'm just spitballing here. That would be lovely. That would be real lovely. Let's go to Sean. Brandon Marsh, team MVP, no question about it. I mean, thank God for Marsh because... Lord knows the rest of this lineup isn't doing a damn thing with the bats. <laughs> Although Alec Bohm had a good night tonight. But once again, I mean, you, you can't argue with the starting pitching the Phillies have thrown out there this year. Other than the second game of the year for Nola, I mean, what more can you ask of your staff than to at least give you a puncher's chance every night? And Ranger Suarez did that and then some today. I honestly thought the longer that game was going one to nothing, that they were going to screw him out of a win, but I'm glad they didn't. Nice, solid start to the series. Want to take at least, I'd say, the next two, but, you know, let's be greedy and grab all four. Absolutely. Two and two would be a disaster. Three and one would satisfy me as long as the fourth game you weren't up seven nothing and then you somehow lose nine seven in devastating fashion. Of course, I need to see exactly how it plays out. But for the most part, from a surface level talk here, yeah, if they go three and one, that's the minimum that I accept. And I want to be greedy as well. Let's take one step at a time, no doubt. You bring up the Marsh thing though, and it makes me ask this question because it is as if Brandon Marsh is carrying the team and the starting pitching. I don't want to downplay what they've done because they've been excellent to your credit. You pointed that out. But with your ability to really get going because of Brandon Marsh, is that a definition of a great team? When Bryce is, and let's just say his timing is off, because that's what the manager says. So if his timing is just off, and Brandon Marsh, who's more of a complimentary piece than a star, unless he is a star, but for the most part, I think it's fair right now for me to say he's a complimentary piece more than a star. If that guy can carry you for a little bit until Bryce Harper steps up, until Kyle Schwarber shows more pop, until all of this starts happening, isn't that what defines a great team? Someone else being the one when the one isn't there. 
That's why the whole Rojas thing, the whole Rojas thing really got me aggravated because everyone says the ninth hole hitter doesn't matter. And I used to feel that way until I saw them lose in the NLCS when their season was on the line with Rojas with the bases loaded in the fourth inning and they completely botched it. It doesn't always land on Bryce. It doesn't always land on Nick. It doesn't always land on JT. It might land on your eight-hole hitter. It might land on your nine-hole hitter. What do you do? Do you have the con- the correct pieces in place? So, is that a real heavy positive spin on this? I'm curious what Christopher Sanchez is going to do next. Because his last start wasn't great grind it a little bit. So what does he respond with? I like him a lot. I really do. For a back-end starter type of deal. And I believe he's facing Bailey Falter. So we'll see how that goes. Because that's almost uh, as if that was Bailey Falter's job at one point. And then he was, uh, no, 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 that ain't, ain't going to pan out, fellas. <laughs> ain't going to work. Uh, who else? Uh, Connor Brogdon, I think, just had one of his debuts in L.A. And boy, it did not go well. It went just about as you would have expected this version of Connor Brogdon to go. Poor guy. Not too long ago, he was a stud in the postseason. What the hell happened? Well, they asked for more slug, and there's your slug. (laughs) Bomer gets it started. And then Brandon Marsh, this guy is amazing. I mean, I am amazed at how he has performed so far. We know he's a great baseball player, but I didn't expect this out of him in spring training. And uh, Scotty had the other one, good line shot on the fastball. And a Ranger, great start today, eight strikeouts, six strong innings. So above 500 now, I think that was a satisfying game, you know, just played strong throughout. Uh Nothing really that annoyed me that I can complain about. So, great win for the Phils. Let's build on it and sweep these bums. That's right, Zach. (laughs) That's right, Zach. I appreciate the call. I do want to go back to a call before, though, because Sean brought up Kyle Schwarber, and I don't want to lose this thought. But with Kyle Schwarber, he has more singles, right? And there was a time earlier in the year when people got excited about that, and I did too because as much as I praise and I'm a jerk-off about all the home runs in the world and the best leadoff hitter on planet Earth because he is, in fact, the best leadoff hitter on planet Earth, I like the idea of him maybe using the other field and, in theory, the singles and all. I'm tired of the singles, though. Kyle Schwarber hitting singles, it doesn't have the same impact that the 50 bombs do, that the 47 bombs do, that the home run power does. So it's cute, all right? And it's fun to pretend like small ball works. Small ball doesn't work. And maybe you can find examples of other teams recently have some version of success. The Cleveland Guardians a few years ago, the Arizona Diamondbacks. There have been examples of teams, and they have ceilings. They're not able to close the door and finish it off, but they have ceilings and whatever. But this team, this team, if, if Kyle Schwarber was on that Cleveland Guardians team from a few years back, they're, they're not asking him to do small ball. You do that when you have to because you, you, you don't really have anything else because you're not talented enough. It's a scrappy way of playing. I think that winning scrappy here and there over 162 is fine, but if it's not your overall identity, yeah, sometimes you need to just grind out a game. You do. Sometimes you got to grind out a game. It's 3-1. You get a lot of guys on base, but you can't really do it. Maybe it's an infield dribbler that gets the, the winning run scored, and that's the way you win in, in the eighth inning. Whatever. Just something like that. Yeah, don't get me wrong. There's, there's truth to that. There is. That's important. It's not devalued by any means, but we really got to let them do them. That's what I think it needs to, to come down to. And I do wonder... If because last year went a certain way and Rob talked about how we're going to sit down, we're going to meet with one another, we're going to analyze what happened, we're going to try to see what we can change to be the best version of us, which is all the right stuff to do. But at the end of the day, you can tweak little things here and there. 
I don't know how much you can change, though. I don't. I don't know how much you can change. And I'm okay with that because this team's getting to the World Series and I thought was better than the Texas Rangers last year. They just couldn't get out of their own damn way. So roster-wise, last season, with them being them, I thought that they were good. Just because you don't win doesn't mean your team isn't good enough to win. Do you know how many teams underachieved maybe in a, in a, in a series or underachieved? Football is different because it's one game. But they're roster. I thought the 2022 Eagles, that roster could have won a championship. They could have won a Super Bowl. They lost after having a double-digit lead at halftime in the Super Bowl, but that that roster could. Last year's roster could, could win. They could win a World Series. All they did was fail to execute late. But when they were tearing it up, that philosophy was greater than nothing I've ever seen or greater than everything I've, I've, I've ever seen. There's nothing better. So I know sometimes I think we overcomplicate the issues of previous seasons. Let's uh, take one more call. Hey, bro, it's Roddy Syracuse here. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Solid pitching, Ranger, hell of a game, relievers, great game. And we finally Nick are getting some nukes. Marshy, excellent, and good old Stott. I called him out by name yesterday, and he just served me up a nice big plate of crow. That's how it goes, I'd love to see it now. I'd happily take some seconds and thirds over the rest of this weekend. Beautiful. Beautiful stuff. That's how it goes, though. And, and thanks, Ryan. I appreciate the phone call. That's how it goes. I said it with Bryce Harper earlier, and I wouldn't be stunned if he punches me in the face tomorrow. Okay, I want to give a round of applause, though, in all honesty, to baseball. Because that game was done in, what, two hours and 15? Hallelujah. That, that's great. Oh, that is great. This is a perfect example of what that pitch clock was all about on the genius of Rob Manfred. <laughs> I couldn't even say that jokingly. But in all seriousness, I did love the time and the way it flew. When a game ends around 9 o'clock. 9 o'clock? This is great. Give me 6.40 first pitches and give me two-hour games. Sign me up. All right, everybody. Love you to death. Good win for your fighting fills. We'll see how they respond and, and see if they build off of this uh, tomorrow. Have a good night, everybody.